and uh, that's it. Let's enjoy the last teaching of uh, this year, Christian year. Thank you very much, Christian. Okay, great. Thank you, Laura. So let's start. As usual, with some breathing. Okay. And now visualize in the space in front of you. Buddha Shakyamuni, who's a manifestation of all the great qualities that we can attain. And who's at the same time inseparable from your Kasna Lama. He appears in the form of a fully ordained monk. wisely and compassionately gazing at you. And then surrounding the Buddha all the great lineage masters, starting with those from the Indian, in particular the Lunda tradition. And then those of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. And of all the other traditions. So all the great masters who attained realizations through the teachings of the Buddha. Appear in the space in front of you. Surrounding Buddha Shakyamuni. guiding and inspiring us and serving as our refuge. And of the same nature as your Lama. And then think that 
You're surrounded by all sentient beings. Quietly sitting all around you. And due to the rude misapprehension, experiencing constant problems, sadness, fear, and other types of suffering. The mind's controlled by different types of afflictive emotions. Not knowing the way to lasting happiness. who in the past, in the previous lives, have been so kind to us. Only now we forget how close they were to us at some point in time. And just from the point of view of this life, they're just like us in wanting to be happy and not wanting to suffer. So let's first generate affectionate love. Sense of concern and closeness. What's each and every one of those sentient beings? That love then gives way to great compassion. A type of affection which sincerely wishes for all sentient beings to be free from suffering and wishes to help them. And their pursuit to free themselves from all suffering and its causes.
And as great compassion grows stronger, the aspiration turns into determination to free all sentient beings from their limitating suffering and its causes. To free them from whatever is in the way for them to attain liberation. And since we can accomplish this realistically only once we become enlightened ourselves, generate the mind of enlightenment, bodhicitta. That is the sincere aspiration or even determination to become fully enlightened for the welfare of all sentient beings. And in particular, as to your motivation for this class, I think that it is with the mind of enlightenment that, will, that I will continue to study Chandakirti's verses on the middle way. And without letting go of the mind of enlightenment, let's then recite the prayers. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, by the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. And then particularly directed at all sentient beings surrounding us, May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings never be separated from happiness that is free from suffering. And may all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies.
reverently a prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time. And rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of cyclic existence. and turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own merits and those of others to the great enlightenment. Okay, all right then. Well, this will be the last time I uh, stress the practice of equalizing and exchanging, in particular the exchanging part of this practice before we move on to the, well, the types of consciousness, the types of mental factor that we actually also develop as part of the initial motivation, that is affectionate love. So one more time, this exchanging ourselves with others, we've equalized. Uh, hopefully we've attained a sense of uh, equanimity or equalizing that other sentient beings are equally important as we ourselves for our own well-being and on the conventional as well as on an ultimate level, there really isn't much of a difference between us. Well, definitely not on the on an ultimate level, lacking inherent existence, and that's merely on the conventional level, well, based on I, others, of course, it's only in relation to something that something becomes I versus others, and so forth. And of course, that we will want to be happy and not want to suffer. So in that sense, um, having reflected on all that, and then we try and put ourselves into another person's shoes. They try to take on the place of another person and stop focusing just on our, on our own well-being, but even visualize going as far as trying to think what it's like for that person. And so to go all the way, I really practice this with certain individuals, certain people we may have a hard time with, for instance, or people we just randomly meet somewhere, or just, if you can, with all sentient beings to a certain degree, of course, all seven, like simultaneously doesn't really work, uh, but to get a general sense of like, well, everyone wants to be happy and therefore um, the same sense of responsibility towards my own well-being kind of generate that towards all other sentient beings. But for this week, Having done this for a week now, and maybe initially, uh, well, it took some getting used to, and it's not easy, but I guess after some time, what may happen is that the afflictive emotions, of course, come in. That's, the, that's what really prevents us from being able to practice this most effectively. It's revulsion, resentment towards some people, uh, well, attachment towards, towards others, um, maybe jealousy competitiveness or, or envy with regard to certain people and to try and work with that in particular. So when we have, when there's someone we resent, we have a hard time with, maybe someone really close to us, like a relative or um, someone we don't know that well, whoever it is, sense of resentment. So to work with that, but again, in this context of putting ourselves into that person's shoe. I mean, why are they the way they are? 
becoming aware, of course, first of our resentment, our dislike, and so forth. And then why does it bother me? Why? What is it about that person? And what are the possible causes for them reacting in that way? Am I just seeing it subjectively? Um, maybe even remembering, well, at some point they may have been extremely close to me in this life or in a past life. And they may be, again, really, really close to me in the future. Who knows? And they may even become enlightened before me and be extremely due to our connection, become really important uh, for my own spiritual path and so forth. So none of what I've just said, none of those, those aspects are fictitious. I mean, they're all possible. And so to reflect on that and work with this resentment without oppressing it, without allowing it to run freely, without indulging in it, but instead bringing it into this particular practice. Or if there's, um, I don't know, envy, for instance, someone's got something that we really like, has a quality, has a position, has a relationship, whatever, whatever, something that we resent the other person for having. And also remember, well, we're all the same, that however great the situation of another person seems, they're just as dissatisfied and constantly look for other happiness as we are. That's just because we've got self-grasping, they've got self-grasping, and that is the root for craving and therefore for dissatisfaction. So to remember that, that the grass always looks green on the other side, but that in the end, uh, well, what, it, what the others seem to have, they seem to maybe be much happier and that's actually not the case unless temporarily there's some relief from something greater. So to remember that as well, but also put ourselves into their shoes and be aware they have afflictive emotions, they have misapprehensions just as ourselves. And again, make this extra effort to then generate the wish, may they be happy, may they... They just generate that concern, the same concern that we have for ourselves. But the main point is really like putting ourselves into their shoes and practicing Donglen. We haven't really done great compassion yet. I mean, that's about to come. But anyway, just the wish for them to not suffer, that's not great compassion yet anyway. I mean, what you wish others to be free from is more than just ordinary suffering. So we can start off just wishing for other people to be free from suffering and combine it, of course, with some Donglen. And Donglen, the great, the great advantage of this practice, is easy to visualize. So I explained it last time. It's easy enough to visualize to take on the suffering of others and give your happiness to others. And since we're always breathing, well, it can be easily combined with the breath. So Again, for this following, for this coming week, please make an extra effort. It's only seven, six days this time because we'll have class again on Sunday. Um, but that will any, anyway be the last time that we practice this particular part of this technique to generate bodhicitta. But I want you to make an extra effort, generate the beginner's mind, uh, make an extra effort to make this week really meaningful as the last week in this year well until friday of course only but anyway so uh, yeah that's to come or well, that's what i would like you to do and of course to generate the mind of enlightenment again and again not to forget about that in combination if you were instructed that way by his holiness during the teachings if you were there to combine it with the mind of uh well the wisdom of of emptiness the way you know or the way it's been described to you Okay, so that's for this coming week. And then the summary, to return to the summary. Uh, well, it became obvious from last time that uh, you were not interested in me speeding through it, so I won't do it. Uh, I won't go through it as quickly as I did last time. And I thought, answer some questions. Uh, well, some questions that I received. I think it was about four emails I got, or three. Um, there was a, a 
I don't know whether I should read it, um, but it's it's got this this statement. I think it's from Dalit, if I understand it correctly, and then with the little change from Edward, I think. Uh, so no, anyway, no, no, it's from Edward. Oh, it's from Edward. Oh, okay. 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 Great. All right. Thank you. So he, he says, and I think it's more than it's more a statement, I guess. So matter, matter does not exist inherently, always transforming itself, including energy and mass. And one may also include time, he writes in brackets, movement, as it interacts with matter. Okay, so he describes matter, he describes the physical world, physical existence, and then it goes on, oh, it's a, it's a question. So wouldn't then the separation between body and mind be as artificial as the definition of matter separating between mass and energy or any other subclassification? So wouldn't the separation, this, this is matter, this is a body, this is physical, this is matter on one hand, and then this is the mind, this is mental, wouldn't that separation be as artificial Okay, so the question, of course, is what do you mean with artificial? Uh, not as solid and concrete as it seems? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So is it merely labeled? Is it not intrinsically, inherently, concretely separate? No, it isn't. So this is, yeah, absolutely true. We call it matter on the basis of certain processes, of certain aspects and so forth. But it doesn't exist in and of itself. It's merely labeled. So in answer to that, I hope that answers it. And anyway, there's also something, a question from Tao Seti. I hope I pronounce it correctly. Um, he wrote like a longer question. And in there, I don't want to read the whole thing because it's quite long. But he does something really interesting. He, well... First of all, he wants to ask a Geshe, and that's separate. That's how it's, he starts this question that he asks, when you engage in analysis and you don't find anything, is that correct? You don't find any, and like the, the analysis we do, of course, not just any analysis, but the analysis we do in the context of the, the sevenfold analysis, like how does something exist as a self or as a car and so forth? What makes it a car and so the way we've done it in the past. So if you don't find anything, is that correct? And he says the answer, as far as I remember, is that the cities, the accomplishments, the, the attainments, actually the cities are the accomplishments that you attain when you meditate, that those are real. He says real, uh, well, in the sense of that's what he understood. I mean, I suppose he means like inherently or something existent or more real. Well, actually, according to my understanding, they lack inherent existence in the same way. You wouldn't be able to find the cities either. You wouldn't be able, when engaging in this analysis, what you do when you analyze something, you always an, an, analyze automatically. That's just the nature of this type of analysis, something to exist in and of itself. And there's nothing that can be found. But what I said previously, something that interesting that he does, and there's this whole explanation that I don't need to go into. He's trying to explain, like, how does the self exist? He talks about a process and um, consciousness versus self and so forth. And he's asking, what is the seed? Not S-E-E-D, seed, so, but seed. S-E-A-T, so the seat of consciousness. So he calls it the seat of consciousness. Another word that we could use is the basis or the foundation of consciousness. What is, it? sorry, of, of, the, of the self, not of consciousness, of the self. So what is that basis of, of, of the self? And I, I, I think this question is really interesting. Uh, so, oh, yeah, his question is actually after all this explanation. He says, my question is, does Chandrakirti give any points in his work where he refutes the seat of the self in the process? Uh, what do I get wrong? Where is, where is this mistake when I find the self as a process in the analysis? Oh, he, he compares the self with like a process, like a, he looks at it as a process but seems to ask for this basis. So I'm saying interesting in the sense that 
we usually look for some basis. I mean, the non-Buddhists did that. The non-Buddhists, or as, as humans, let's put it that way. As humans, we always do this, some basis. So if something is just labeled artificial, it's not as real as, as it seems to us, we can take that to a certain degree, but there needs to be something more stable underneath. There's this this need for some base, for some seat of something, S-E-A-T, seat, um, or what have you, like something there, because otherwise you've got nothing out of nothing. So this is what I understood to some degree, at least what he was saying. And the non-Buddhist schools do that. They establish this permanent basis, maybe like some general principle or some underlying universal universalities and what have you. And of course, even... Uh, among the Buddhists, among the Buddhist philosophers, except for the Prasangika, well, they do say, yeah, phenomena are imputed. They're imputed things and they're substantially existent things. So imputed in the way, yeah, we call this a vase, we call this a car, etc. But there must be some substantial essence, some essence, some substantially existent car, something substantially existent must be there. So the car we perceive, yeah, that's just labeled but underneath it there must be something that is substantially more real or with a person there's the imputed person and there's the substantial person there's that which you will find when you analyze the the imputed person so this need there, there needs to be something there and that's very natural because our mind will hold on to something inherent anyway so in what way does he refute? Does is, is refutes? I mean, he doesn't really describe the seed, what he means, but he talks about a process. So, well, actually, when we say self, when we talk about the self not existing inherently, it's a very simplified way in which we describe that because the whole idea of selflessness is so complicated in itself that when we say the self is merely labeled on the basis of its parts, I mean, that's very simplified. I mean, it's much more complicated than that. Because with, with every self, or even just with the car, if you take a car, for instance, well, it is labeled also on the basis of certain functions, of a process, if you like, of actions. I mean, the very least action is change. The act of change, like the car, well, it's made of subtle particles, of subtle atoms, and those change from moment by moment, change moment by moment. So the car, at the very least, has the function of changing, or it performs the function, or it, it acts by way of it changing. Well, how? of course it changes, because if its parts change, it changes. And of course, it is merely labeled on the basis of its parts, of its subtle building blocks and its coarser parts. And so really what it is, is this dynamic, these dynamic things that go through a process, at least the process of change and other processes. And based on that, on the basis of those processes, those functions, those parts, constituents, and so forth, we label ka. And that's it. So there's definitely a process based on which we also label ka. Like I say, this function of change of the the, the constituents, the atoms that it's made of, and so forth, and so forth. So this is true for the car, and that's likewise true for the self, except on top of the physical basis based on which we label self, we also have the mental basis. We have the mental consciousness. We have mind, which is a basis, but a, 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 like a seed, if you like, for the self. It's the basis of imputation, but again, it in itself, it itself is merely labeled, is merely labeled. And there's a process, the process of change. There's the process of perception, of apprehension, of judging, of thinking, of uh, categorizing, and so forth. Everything that the mind does, basically, and everything that the body does. So based on that process of, of change, of, well, whatever the, the blood does, running through the veins, etc. So based on all these actions, processes, functions, and of all the, the, the aspects that go through these processes, we label self. Okay, so it's, the basis is extremely complicated and extremely uh, sophisticated. But based on that, we say I or self. So if you like to call that a seat, 
Surely, but that in itself is again merely labeled. I can then take each of these bases, the body, and then the parts of the body, and they were just, they're just like the self, based on certain processes of parts that are not itself, but based on which we label body and so forth. Well, we have a body, and then you take the body parts, and you can do this with everything, with every part, with every basis of reputation, it goes on endlessly. So I hope I answered this question and did not cause more confusion. So does he refute the seed of the self in the process? Well, yes, Lam Chintakirti does. The seed, like the basis, is the basis for the self, is the seed of the self is the basis of imputation, body and mind. And well, sometimes by implication, sometimes directly so. He's saying, well, there's nothing that exists inherently. So therefore, uh, that means also the spaces, body, mind, and so forth, they don't exist inherently. Consciousness doesn't exist inherently, and so forth. These processes don't exist inherently. But the analysis, again, is the same. Where's the process? Where's the, where's the action within the act, like within the parts it's made of? If you take an action, what is an action? Well, an action can only be explained over time. So when we say the car, we don't necessarily talk about yesterday's cars or tomorrow's cars. When we keep it simple, we just talk about the car right now we can see. But with an action, you need to consider time. You need to think of a, of a um, temporal continuum, a continuum in time. Because walking, for instance, the action of walking, of movement, it's made up of, of time frames, if you like, of different moments in time where you, the foot, you know, is lifted and then move forwards and, and set down again and so forth. So all this, there's like a process, you think of it like a movie passing by and there are all these little picture frames. Um, so it's a bit like that. It's made up of all these moments when you walk, like movie frames, like parts of a movie, like these little photographic I don't know, there's these photographs that you have and when you when you play them, then you see this this movement. So likewise, in daily life, we have these moments or in doing any kind of actions, you have these moments. And so what is the action? Like, is it each moment, all of them? Is it one particular moment? Uh, each moment, all of them together? That wouldn't work because like in existing in one moment together or at a different moment. So when you start analyzing, that action starts disappearing. That's just because it doesn't exist inherently. It's merely labeled. So when you analyze, you, you, you go beyond mere convention. Oh, based on certain moments, I label such and such. No, if you start analyzing, you're analyzing something very concrete and that can't be found. You're analyzing the way it appears to us. Okay. All right. I hope I've answered this to some degree. I, I remember there was something else I wanted to say, but I don't remember right now. I may remember as we continue. Yeah. So that's, I hope, process here again. Like I said, process means really just a function and actions, functions are very similar. Anyway, we'll hopefully get do more of this uh, as part of the summary. Um, and then I believe there's one more question. I okay, might as well just answer uh, that mention this by Jimmy. He read in the eighth chapter, Shantideva's Bodhisattva Way of Life. Very good. He read the eighth chapter, verse 98. It says, 94, sorry, verse 94, hence I should dispel the misery of others because it is suffering just like my own. And he's arguing, well, there's some problems with this because their suffering comes because of, it can only be exhausted once um, the negative karma is exhausted. So how they should, they have to bear their suffering uh, in order to avoid even more, I mean, not to accumulate even worse negative karma. And so his argument is really, how can you remove their suffering? Their suffering arises in their own mind. I can't do anything about their mind. Um, suffering arises due to past non-virtuous actions and so forth. And anyway, how do I know another person is suffering? So there's like quite a few aspects in there. And of course, it doesn't let, literally mean I can take away their suffering. Even if I do Donglen, I don't literally take anyone's suffering. 
So that doesn't happen. That is just for my own mind, a simplified version of what I hope to do one day and at least get ready to take on that responsibility uh, through this visualization. Well, therefore, it's really, sometimes it's formulated in that way. I take their suffering. Sometimes like the wish I can protect them from suffering. But it really means that may one day I'd be ready to help them to create the causes to remove the suffering. So of course, we don't have to wait for negative karma to ripen in the form of some karmic experience. It can be purified. It can be purified by applying the four powers, power of remorse and so forth, um, and certain purification practices, even right now without an understanding of emptiness and even without uncontrived that is spontaneous bodhicitta we can still um, do purification practices and the most powerful purification practice is realizing emptiness directly i mean even just uh, reflecting on emptiness applying the four powers and instead of doing prostrations or mantra recitations we could also do a meditation on emptiness and again it's an extremely powerful means to purifying negative karma but we can help someone to accomplish this because we didn't do it alone we met the dharma at some point we received teachings from the buddha so no one is going to make it just totally on their own because of our interdependence we need others and we can be those others to again those who need our help and that's why we want to become fully enlightened and so forth so that's that one aspect we don't literally take away their suffering but we help them to help them show them how to do it, ideally, once we've done it ourselves. But even in the meantime, we can possibly assist them. And yes, this argument uh, that's often made, this argument, I can't put myself into another person's shoes. I don't know what they're going through. I can't read their minds. He says facial expressions can be deceptive and so can be words. He's totally right. So without needing to... Uh, read all his arguments he's right with this i can only hear what they're saying etc so there seems to be a lot of problems for that so how can you really put yourself into another person's shoes and of course it's limited but we should when we analyze when we analyze when we talk to other people when we when we when we're more perceptive as to how others are i mean we come to see we're so alike the differences between us are outweighed by what we have in common with others And so I think we can be, even though we can never exactly know, no, we can't know what, at least as long as we don't have the ability to know another person's mind and so forth, which are all abilities which we can develop. But just as ordinary paths without a great deal of concentration and so forth, well, we can understand to some degree that the other person suffers when they're insulted, that they don't feel happy that they don't want to experience this, just this not wanting to experience that and how that exactly feels, if we, even if we don't know it. But the knowledge we have, the limited knowledge we have is sufficient to generate uh, the type of compassion, the type of care that we need. And of course, to generate at some point bodhicitta to then, to then work towards a state where we can know exactly how it feels for others. Yeah, so what we can know, I think, is sufficient. And of course, we continuously work on that to make it stronger. And I mean, we know in our everyday life, I mean, like a a mother, for instance, like when you're really close to your child and you know this child really well, and you know exactly what to do in a certain situation to release their suffering, you know, I mean, what they're going through to relieve their suffering, you know that in that moment. So that shows the knowledge that a mother, as an example, has in that situation is sufficient to know what to do to help that child. And that's just an example. There are lots of other examples. But our problem is that we're so concerned with ourselves all the time, we just need to spend more time uh, putting ourselves into the shoes of others, right? And then more time, of course, then eventually to generate great compassion and so forth. All right, that's it. Those are the questions. I received. And then to go back to the summary. All right. Now, the the, the verses I, I went through last time, I'll just say a word, a word or two about 
these verses very quickly, just for you not to lose sight of what we're doing. And then I'll continue with the ordinary summary. Okay, so we started off with just explaining why selflessness of person, of course, is important. In what way is it relevant? All our trouble comes from not understanding it. All right. And then, of course, the next step would be, what is this self? What is this I? If this is our trouble, if this is a troublemaker, at least on the basis of the existent I, apprehending the I in a certain way, if that in a certain mistaken way, if that is the, the reason for all our suffering, well, then let's look at the way we apprehend the I in that mistaken way, the way we perceive of ourselves and check whether such a self, a self we cherish so much, a self our whole life revolves around whether that actually exists. And so we have the analysis, does it exist separate from mind and body? It does appear as kind of kind of separate, but really this kind of kind of separate doesn't work if it exists inherently. Either it's totally separate or it's not, but you can't have something in between. So for that inherent I, if it's totally separate, well, the way the non-Buddhist, some of the non-Buddhist philosophers, for instance, describe it even as permanent, as this permanent entity, well, that certainly doesn't work as, as permanent. But you sh- as implied by these verses, also you should be able to find it. There should be something separate from mind and body. You find, and anyway, how can you refer to I, I have a headache when my when my head hurts, if it's totally separate from mind and body. So I wouldn't age, I wouldn't get sick, I wouldn't be miserable, because it's got nothing to do with my mind and body. So it exists in that separate way. So that doesn't work. Then, of course, we had about, well, about eight verses, the idea, the self, the self and the, the, the body, sorry, yeah, the self and mind and body, they're all one. If they're not separate, the other option would be that the eye is one with mind and body, is one with the aggregates. That's the other option. So either here different ideas presented by the Buddhist schools. And what does this also talk about? It talks about the, the two possibilities. If there really is an I, but exists in that, in, in the way we perceive it to exist, this, this inherent I, some, some real essence there, something inherently there, well, either it's one with the aggregates or separate. Separate, we've already done. So only one is the other option. Now, this analysis now, how what would be the absurdity if the I were to exist as one with the aggregates that is described in the context of certain uh, Buddhist schools who have said, and I spoke about it before, they do say, well, there's this imputed I, all right. So certainly they have a sense and it's the definition, the definition of person and person doesn't necessarily just mean to human doesn't necessarily refer only to a human. Any living being in the Buddhist text is called person. Now, in English, that's weird. But even in Tibetan, like the word for person in Tibetan may not be ordinarily in everyday life be, be referring to just any living being. Well, but in the Buddhist context, definitely it refers to any living being is called person. All right. So person, like even a dog is a person, but just not a human being. Anyway, that's just how the words are used. So, therefore, when you take um, a, a, a person, so they say there's this, they, they use as a definition uh, a being who is, mere, who is labeled on the basis of the five aggregates. That's the definition of person. So, they, they actually say that there's, a, there's an imputed person, that the person you perceive you perceive, for instance, a body and you see, oh, I see this person, right? So they don't say that's a problem because if the person were not imputed, you couldn't say, oh, I see his face and therefore I see him. You couldn't say that because if person were necessarily, for instance, just the mental consciousness, well, I never see a mental consciousness other than my own self and I don't see that I not with my eye consciousness at least I perceive it but it's only my own mental consciousness that I'm aware of and not of another person's mental consciousness so if the other Buddhist philosophical schools other than the Prasagika were not to accept that there's an imputed person 
that would be absurd because they would have to say, you can't see another person. I can't see this person walk across the street. That wouldn't work. So they do accept there is an imputed person. They do accept something like a vase or a chariot that is imputed. But they say, if that is imputed, then there must be some substantial basis there. There must be a substantial person, a substantially existent person that is not labeled, that is really a person. So when you search for this imputed person, you'll find some essence there. You'll find some substantially existent person. Okay, so that is, that is the basis for now analyzing the next verses where you, you analyze the person now existing as one with the aggregates, but based exactly on that view, on that view that there is a person, there's really an, an essential person there. And although we were not followers of these other philosophical schools, but if you learn what they're saying, that makes total sense. There is this imputed person because I do say I see Joe when I see Joe's body. So, and I still think there's some Joe-ness, there's some soul, there's the real Joe behind that person. So if I have a crush, for instance, or I'm, I'm attached to Joe for, as an example, well, there's some Joe-ness I'm attached to. It's beyond his body. His body and his mind connect, but there's something beyond there. There's this real Jonas. And in the same way, I look at myself. I don't say my mind and my body are me. And still, when I when when my, my, my body hurts, I say I hurt because I have a feeling there's this substantial underlying person. And I do say this other person saw me. Still, I would say, oh, he saw me. He just saw me. So I, I don't necessarily think they believe this other person saw my real inner self. So I believe in that real inner self and then this imputed self. So by without using this terminology, because otherwise, if they see my face, why do they see me? So I have this set. So, I mean, I don't put it into this, these words. It kind of makes sense, therefore, when this Vatantrika Madhyamika, which is not the highest philosophical school, when they say, yeah, there's this imputed person and there's this underlying substantial person. It makes sense. And then the same applies to a car and a vase. There's this imputed vase and there's this real substantial, there's some essence there that makes the vase a vase. Okay, that is what they hold. And when you really think about it, it makes sense. Because when I said earlier in, in response to Tao City's questions, well, there's this need for some seat, S-E-A-T, seat, some basis, some foundation, something a little bit real, more real there. And then I can take uh, imputation. That's all right. Things are imputed. No problem. I just call it a car. Right, but there's something really, really there, some some real basis. So, having said all this, so therefore, these following verses are exactly that. Some say the self is all all the aggregates. Some philosophers say that, but as philosophers, and some say um, it's just the mental consciousness. So, if it's all of them, you have many, many selves. That's one problem they present here. And anyway. If the, 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 if the self is the aggregates, well, they change when you become, when you attain nirvana. And so at the time of nirvana, there's no longer a self. It, it disappears, that old self. And so an inherent self, it would disappear. And even moment by moment, you wouldn't have a self because from moment by moment, it's different. So you couldn't have a continuum, they argue. And so if you say unrelated phenomena form a continuum, that's not called a continuum. I cannot form a continuum with Leora because we're totally separate entities. So if they're separate moments, it doesn't work. Okay, that's, I'm just racing through the summary of the summary. You know, I'm doing the summary of the summary from last time. Okay, that was 120, so that was 29, 100 to 30. Sorry, I didn't give you verse numbers, but I'll do it now. And then 130, well, we're told that someone objects to this and oh, no, no, sorry. And 130, what is said is that anyway, if you perceive selflessness, then you have to perceive the non existence of the aggregates of the aggregates of the self. So if you perceive no self, you perceive no aggregates. And that doesn't really make sense. But then someone says, oh, no, no, when you perceive selflessness, you negate an eternal, a permanent, eternal self. 
Um, and then in response to that, Chandakiji says, well, okay, an internal self, but then that's got nothing to do with the aggregates because we're not negating permanent aggregates here, are we? And anyway, if you perceive the lack of an internal kind of self, well, then how do you, and you, and you don't realize anything in response in, in relation to the aggregates, because it's certainly not a permanent, not permanent aggregates we're, we're uh, refuting when we realize selflessness. So we don't eliminate real attachment and other afflictive emotion in relation to the aggregates. So that doesn't seem right. Anyway, there's just this kind of a little bit uh, complicated discussion, verse 130, 131, and so forth. Anyway, then in 132, we're told, well, but actually the opponent argues that what has said that there is no self that exists separate from the aggregates, or, or in other words, the, the Buddha actually says that, um, that the aggregates, no, sorry, the, the Buddha said that the aggregates are the self, sorry, the Buddha himself said the aggregates are the self. He himself has argued that way um, in, in certain sutras. But in response to that, of course, Chandrakirti says, no, 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 he didn't argue, he didn't say the self were the aggregates, he just said the self doesn't exist separate from the aggregates. That is different. Um, so that's 132, 133. And then we have a few verses, 134, uh, starting with 134, where, where Chandrakirti tells us, well, anyway, if we look at the aggregates, um, not being the person. So in, in terms of this argument, a really uh, important argument is that the collection of the aggregates is not the person because that's really the tendency we have is to think it's the collection. And that doesn't make sense, he says, because very clearly the Buddha described to us the self. And he, here he's, he quotes the Buddha because that was the last argument uh, the opponent gave anyway. He was quoting the Buddha. So he's saying, well, if you were following what the Buddha says, the Buddha was very clear that the self is a protector, it is that which is tamed, it's a witness. So he talks about this entity that we don't talk of the body and the, the, the mind as, as a protector and a tamed, that which is to be tamed and the witness and so forth, the, the tamer, no, that which tames. So that wouldn't really make sense. You don't describe the five aggregates in that way. Um, and anyway, um, the Buddha also states that actually, the if you take the the person for instance, so no, when you take the person, so the person is not the aggregates because the person exists independence on the aggregates. So there's already a distinction. Something depends on the aggregate. You can't be the aggregates, or the aggregates and the self cannot be one. The connection of the aggregates cannot be cannot be one with the self. Because then how could it depend on the aggregates if they're just one? That wouldn't make sense. Then there's also this argument, well, if you were to argue it's the shape of the collection of the arguments, uh, if, you, if you were to argue it's the shape of the collection of the aggregates, well, the shape is only something physical. It's only something they find on a physical level. And who would say that the person is the shape? Because that would mean the shape of the body and the person is not the body. And anyway, um, in relation, and that was 136, then in 137, he says, well, anyway, the self is often described as the appropriator or that, that which takes possession of the five aggregates or which has taken possession of the five aggregates. And the aggregates, mind and body, are that which the self has taken possession of, where it is the possessor of. How could they be one? They cannot be one. It's not the same thing. Um, and therefore, this, this in no way makes any sense. Um, so the self is the self is the appropriator and so forth. Um, if you distinguish between the I and that which it controls, for instance, mind and body, we do talk like that in a conventional sense that it, I control my own body, my own mind. So there's something which is being controlled and uh, which controls, or I watch my own mind, for instance. And again, there's something that is being watched and that which watches. So the agent and an object, it doesn't make sense that they're the same. So again, uh, that argument. 
Um, and when you perceive the self, you certainly don't perceive all five aggregates anyway. When you perceive the self, you don't perceive mind and body, which of course is also an argument why the self is not mind and body. We can perceive another person's self. We can perceive our own self, think of our own self. We don't necessarily think of the collection of mind and body, of body and mind, all of them together. We may take a certain aspect, my own mind, my own body, but not mind and body, like with a collection of every part that makes me. Again, that wouldn't make sense. Anyway, verse 138, 139, um, the Buddha said in the meeting of Father and Son Sutra that the self is just dependent on the six elements, um, earth, water, fire, wind, consciousness, and space. And based on that, labeled on the basis of those, we label I. Okay. And so therefore, um, yeah, it is merely labeled. And again, the self is not the collection of the aggregates. Why? Because, well, when we apprehend the self, we don't apprehend all of them. We apprehend something that is merely labeled on the basis of them. That's just a short summary of what was before 138 and 139, those two verses. All right. This is, I think, uh, how far we got. Oh, yes, you were so Okay, highlighting that. This is how far we go. So there was, this was this brief summary from before. And then to continue in 140, well, there it says, um, oh, yes, the, oh, we may have done that last time. Anyway, this was this last argument about the, the eternal self that someone says, well, actually, when you realize selflessness, you negate an eternal self. Of course, it's important to to negate like a permanent self, for instance. We have a sense that there's an actual self that doesn't change. We have that sense. However, that is not enough to eliminate self-grasping, right? So you say that's an eternal self that is negated when no self is realized, yet you do not consider that to be the basis of eye grasping. So you don't say that this is the basis um, you're not saying so that this is really none of the Buddhist schools would actually accept that the eternal self is the apprehended is either the apprehended or focal object. None of the two objects. Um, so the eternal, the permanent self is neither the basis for grasping at a self that doesn't exist, nor is it the apprehended object. None of the schools would say that this is the self, I mean, the existence self with the focal object self, which is the existence self, nor the apprehended self that needs to be negated. None of them say that this is the self that is apprehended as part of the root of samsara. Okay. So therefore, um, they're not direct opposites. For instance, if you take the self-grasping mind, that is the root of samsara, and the mind that perceives an eternal self. Their objects are not complete opposites. Okay, maybe I was a little confusing. So anyway, I say it again. In verse 40, it says, the eternal self cannot be that which we realize when we realize selflessness, simply because the eternal self is neither the focal object, the focal object of self-grasping, that is the root of samsara, the focal object is the conventional existent self, nor is the eternal self the apprehended object, that which the mind believes that existent self to exist as, so exist as the eternal self. That's not what the self-grasping that is the root of samsara apprehends, which is why they're not direct opposites. Self-grasping and the mind that realizes the lack of an eternal self, the mind that realizes the lack of an eternal self and self-grasping, that is the root of samsara, in terms of their objects, they're not direct opposites and they have to be. That is one of the, the most important uh, ideas um, in, 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 Buddhist, in, in the Prasangika school in particular, but also true for the other schools. If you talk about a root of all afflictions, the root cause of also, uh, the root cause of all afflictions. So that mind, in terms of its main object, 
has to stand in terms of that object in direct contradiction to that which you need to realize in order to eliminate samsara. So they have to be in direct opposite. They have to be in, they have to be direct opposite. So in the Prasagika school, they're direct opposites. You have to realize the lack of inherent existence. And what do you apprehend? Inherent existence as the root cause. Okay, but if you still claim, in 141, it says, if you still claim in order to eliminate the root of samsara, you don't need to realize the opposite of that which the self-grasping mind apprehends. Well, that, that, it's ridiculous because that would be like... Um, that would be like if you if there's someone um, um, like who's who's afraid, uh, like a man's fear that there is a snake in the cracks of his of the walls of his house. In order to eliminate the fear of that person, if you were to tell this person there's no elephant in the house, well, that would be ridiculous because the knowledge of there being no no elephant in his house does not get rid of the fear of the presence of the snake. All right. So in the same way. The knowledge that there's no eternal self does not eliminate our innate self-grasping. Okay. So that was 141. And then 142 to 145, that is four verses. Um, those four verses, what do they deal with? Well, they explain that with regard to the previous analysis. So the previous analysis was the self doesn't exist as one with the aggregates, not as separate from the aggregates. It's not the collection, it's not the shape. So these four aspects were briefly addressed. They will be addressed again, but briefly um, we had an, a, a reason was given for why none of those four extremes make sense. But then the three more extremes left, according to Chandrakirti, who does this fourfold, sevenfold analysis, so where seven extremes are refuted. And so what comes next uh, is that now, what is shown now is that the, the self, the way it appears to us, the inherent self does not depend on the aggregates, nor do the aggregates depend on it. And the inherent I does not possess the aggregates. So those are three positions that have to be um, eliminated here or have to be refuted, three extremes. So the first extreme, an inherent self does not exist in the aggregates. That's what it says in verse 142. The self does not exist in the aggregates. So that means the self does not depend on the aggregates. Here the word exist in the aggregates. It's the same as saying the self does not depend on the aggregates. And we are talking about an inherent self. That's important. The self as it appears to us. That's, that's the whole way through. How it actually exists will be explained in the end. But in the beginning, it's just the I, the way it appears to us. Let's look for it. It does not exist in the aggregates in the way that it would depend on the aggregates. Likewise, the aggregates, they do not depend on the self. So the aggregates do not exist in the self. Okay? The aggregates do not exist in the self. Um, because that would mean that they're totally separate. That kind of an inherent self, and if an inherent self existed and it were to exist as dependent on the aggregates or the aggregates dependent on it, which of course would actually not make sense. But let's say hypothetically, you were to insist, someone were to insist an inherent I is possible plus there's this these two alternate alternative or alternate, these two uh, ways in which they could depend on each other. I mean, only one of the two. So the I exists inherently and it depends on the aggregates or the I exists inherently and the aggregates depend on it. So both cases wouldn't make sense because that would mean they're totally separate entities. And we've already seen that's not, not the case. So the example is like, uh, for instance, a, a bowl, like a, 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 a an empty bowl and some yogurt or some curd inside it. Or you have a cave that's like the aggregates and the tiger inside it. All right. Um, so that would be um, like the cave being like, uh, like I said, the aggregate or forest made of many trees and a tiger inside it. Or the other way around, um, I don't know, the different 
body parts of the tiger being within the tiger or something or be, being within the body let's put it that way oh no that's not a good example no no they're not separate um i don't know lots of stones being in the cave so the cave in one example the, the tiger being like the self and the the cave being like the aggregates um one being in the other or the stones within the cave is like the aggregates of the self is like the cave. So they're all separate entities. The, 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 the cave itself, the, the rocks that surround those, those, those rocks on the ground, for instance. So they're separate entities. In other words, in, in everyday life, when you have entities, one depending on the other, they're usually separate entities. And so if the I were to exist inherently, they would have to be separate. Okay, that's 142. Therefore, this possibility doesn't make sense. An inherent self depending on the aggregates or the aggregates dependent on inherent self. And then what about the possession? 143, if something possesses something, well, there are two possibilities. There are only two possibilities. Um, either um they're of a different nature so that which possesses is of a different nature than that which is possessed for instance in the case of someone owing some cows now that doesn't make sense or they're of one nature like devadatta that's given in the commentary devadatta this particular person has a body um but that doesn't make sense again because an inherent self if it were to have a a body like in the sense of being one nature that would have to be one that would have to be identical and again it doesn't work so since self cannot be said to own the aggregate of forms since self does not exist such ownership is meaningless um first of all well it doesn't exist inherent well it, there's no self that exists separate from this ownership uh so one owns one owns a cow through difference or body through inheritance and none of those is an option so the self can only exist in one of the two one of those two ways, but we've already established, we already established that the self doesn't exist separate, like the owner of a cow existing separate from the cow. And we've already established that body and self, for instance, are not one. So self is neither identical to nor different from the body. So it's really saying if that depend, if that ownership was possible, then they would either be one or separate, and we have already seen this is not an option. That's not possible. Okay. Then with 144, verse 144, um, that's just summarizing some of the essential points, in particular, not so much with the self not existing separate from the aggregates, but as asserted by the Buddhist philosophers, uh, it's basically telling us the body is not the self, nor does the self possess the body. We've just heard why that doesn't make sense. Uh, the self does not exist in the body, nor does the body exist in the self. Okay, that's just a summary of what we've heard before. Um, so if you've taken these, these four ideas um, and really meditate, so this is really bringing it all together. That just doesn't make sense that the body is the self, doesn't make sense. The self possesses the body and so forth. And you can now apply this to the other aggregates. It's not the discrimination. The self is not the discrimination or the discernment or feeling or consciousness. It's none of those. Um, nor does it possess feeling and so forth. And in that way, you can apply this, these four, these four statements or these four um, truth. Four, four points to each of the aggregates. So four times five, you have 20 views. These are considered the 20 views of self. And that should be done, of course, within the meditation. And then there's this poetic verse, when the scepter of an Arya's direct realization on the, in 145, when the scepter of an Arya's direct realization of self, this is crushes or eliminates self-grasping. These 20 extreme views um, that are connected to self-grasping will also be demolished, okay? So this mountain of self-view uh, belonging to the mighty range of identity view, that will also be demolished altogether, okay? So um, that's 145, and today we don't have as much time as last time. 
But uh, what we've had therefore so far is the seven extremes were eliminated. The seven the sevenfold analysis was done in a short way, in a brief way, and then more extensive explanation follows. And what follows from now on is 146. And I only mention it, but I'm not going to go through it because it's time to meditate. But um, yeah, so starting with 146, there is an alternative view that is um, explained by someone called the Samityas, which are actually a sub-school of the Vaibhashika, the lowest philosophical school. But they have an unusual view because this whole idea, we had this analysis, either one or different, uh, even in the context of aggregates depending on self, self depending on aggregates and so forth. We had, we had this, this, um, this problem, again, either one or different, but they are getting around this problem by saying it's indescribable. It's inexpressible, inexpressible as one or different. So anyway, that it's, at first hearing it, it seems to make sense. But then, of course, Chandrakirti argues against it. All right. So today we really didn't get that much done, but at least I answered some of your questions. And hopefully with the speedy summary I did last time, that was probably a little confusing. Um, therefore, I hope I was able to bring it together a little bit better again. And then I'll continue with the last verses. We've got 25 to go, 26 or 30, 35 to go, 35 to go. Uh, we'll do them next time. Okay. All right. So time is up. Let's do some meditation now. Okay. And again, we start with some breathing meditation. Okay. The mindfulness of the breath. So once again, bring to mind your sense of I. In particular, your sense of I when you feel upset. When you feel humiliated or insulted. Or, and you're embarrassed. Can you get a sense that that eye is not the eye that others perceive?
that there is an imputed I. Due to which when someone sees your body, you say they saw me. And that there is real I. Non-imputed, substantial, inherent I. Do we have this sense? This is also true for another person. That there is an imputed person in the sense that when we see their body, we think we see this person. And that there's still some deeper person, some deeper soul. That exists within their mind and body. That is the substantial, the inherently existent self, which we believe is findable, which our mind holds on to as findable. Which is asserted by the lower Buddhist philosophical schools. So take a moment and remember why it cannot exist separate from mind and body. But if it doesn't exist separate, it's separate from mind and body, well, it could only be one with mind and body. What's the problem with that? How could the self be the appropriator of mind and body? If they are not separate. How can the self watch mind and body?
if the self is mind and body. And if the self were mental consciousness, well, there's so many different types. And also, if the inherent I existed, and we accepted that it depended on the aggregates, And they be totally separate. And which way around would it be anyway? Would the self depend on the aggregates? Or the aggregates on the self? Would the self exist in the aggregates or the aggregates in the self? And even if we accepted both, the problem would be self and aggregates would be separate. Just as the trees are separate from the tiger within it. Or oh, the cookies are different from the bowl in which they lie. And could an inherent I own the aggregates, possess them? Well, when it comes to ownership, there are two possibilities.
either a farmer owns something that is totally separate from him, like a cow. Or a farmer owns something that is the same nature as him, like a body, like his body. Well, if the inherent self owned its body the way a farmer owns his cow, the self will be totally separate from body again. Which we know doesn't make sense. And in the alternative case, a farmer owing, owning his body, that would mean the inherent eye were of the same nature and therefore one with its aggregates. again doesn't make sense and therefore let's see whether we can once again come to a conclusion this I as we perceive of that we worry about that we're scared for and so forth we cherish so much simply a creation of our own mind. And real freedom means to let go. Of that non-existent I. Now at the very end, whatever feeling has arisen, whatever insight you've reached, by a single point of concentration to further internalize that.
and then to dedicate whatever positive potential we've accumulated today. Let's first dedicate it towards our own enlightenment, thinking may this virtue become a cause for us to completely purify our mind, to transform it into the enlightened state of a Buddha, for the welfare of all sentient beings. may also cause the life of our precious lamas to be extremely long and healthy so that they may continue to guide us on the path to enlightenment. And may also this virtue we accumulate, it may create more peace, peace of mind for those beings around us, help them to, to better handle the challenges of daily life. Help those who are sick, like Tali Lubin, to recover soon. those who are imprisoned mm -hmm. by their own afflictions or physically kept prisoners and so forth. May they soon be freed. Physically and mentally. And of course, as described by Shantideva. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. And most importantly, for as long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain, until then, may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Okay, great, thank you. And all that's left just to remind you once again, uh, to focus on exchanging, not just equalizing, but mainly exchanging self with others. Uh, in the way we described it, to watch your own afflictions, your own afflictive emotions as they prevent you from doing so effectively. Uh, bodhicitta, of course, should be on your mind as often as you can. And, and I forget to say that, but I hope I don't need to really remember, of course, what we've done here and bring this also into your daily life, especially when it comes to the self 
um, and the reasoning that I presented here. All right, then all that's left is to wish you a good week. Be well, be healthy, and uh, I see you again next Sunday. Okay. Have a happy new year, everybody. Oh, yeah. Happy new year. See you next year. See you next year. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you, Geshima. Bye-bye.